I approached it and touched it with my hand. It was a black cat, a very large one, fully as large as Pluto, and closely resembling him in every respect but one. Pluto had not a white hair upon any portion of his body, but this cat had a large, although indefinite, splotch of white, covering nearly the whole region of its breast. Upon my touching him, he immediately rose, purring loudly, rubbing against my hand, and appeared delighted with my notice. This, then, was the very creature which I was in search. I had once offered to purchase it of the landlord, but this person made no claim to it, knew nothing of it, had never seen it before. I continued my caresses, and when I prepared to go home the animal evinced a disposition to accompany me. I permitted it to do so, occasionally stooping and patting it as I proceeded. When it reached the house it domesticated itself at once, and became immediately a great favorite with my wife. For my own part, I soon found a dislike to it arising within me. This was just the reverse of what I had anticipated, but I know not how or why it was. Its evident fondness for myself rather disgusted and annoyed. By slow degrees, these feelings of disgust and annoyance rose into a bitterness of hatred. I avoided the creature. A certain sense of shame and remembrance of my former deed of cruelty, preventing me from physically abusing it. I did not, for some weeks, strike or otherwise violently ill-use it, but gradually, very gradually, I came to look upon it with unutterable loathing, and to flee silently from its odious presence as from the breath of a pestilence. What added no doubt to my hatred of the beast was the discovery on the morning after I brought it home that, like Pluto, it had also been deprived of one of its eyes. This circumstance, however, only endeared it to my wife, who, as I had already have said, possessed in a high degree that humanity of feeling which had once been my distinguishing trait, and the source of many of my simplest and purest pleasures. With my aversion to this cat, however, its partiality for myself seemed to increase. It followed my footsteps with a pernacity which would be difficult to make the reader understand. Wherever I sat, it would crouch beneath my chair or spring upon my knees, covering me with its loathsome caresses. If I arose to walk, it would get between my feet and nearly throw me down, or fastening its long, sharp claws into my dress, clamber in this manner to my breast. At such times... Although I longed to destroy it with a blow, I was yet withheld from doing so, partly by my memory of my former crime, but chiefly, let me confess it at once, by absolute dread of the beast. This dread was not exactly a dread of physical evil, and yet I should be at a loss how to otherwise define it. I am almost ashamed to own Yes, even in this felon's cell I am almost ashamed to own, that the terror and horror which the animal inspired me had been heightened by one of the merest chimeras it would have been possible to conceive. My wife had called my attention more than once to the character of the mark of white hair of which I have spoken, and which constituted the sole visible difference between the strange beast and the one I had destroyed. The reader will remember that this mark, although large, had been originally very indefinite. But by slow degrees, degrees nearly imperceptible, and which for a long time my reason struggled to reject as fanciful, it had at length assumed a rigorous distinctness of outline. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name. And for this above all I loathed and dreaded, and would have rid myself of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, the image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows. O oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death. And now was I indeed wretched beyond the wretchedness of mere humanity, and a brute beast whose fellow I had contemptuously destroyed, a brute beast to work out for me, for me a man, 
fashioned in the image of the high God, so much of insufferable woe. Alas, neither by day nor by night knew I the blessing of rest any more. During the former the creature left me no moment alone, and in the latter I stated hourly from dreams of unutterable fear, to find hot breath of the thing upon my face and its vast weight, an incarnate nightmare that I had no power to shake off, incumbent eternally upon my heart. Beneath the pressures of torment such as these, the feeble remnant of the good within me succumbed. Evil thoughts became my sole intimates, the darkest and most evil of thoughts. The moodiness of my usual temper increased hatred of all things and of all mankind, while from the sudden, frequent, and ungovernable outburst of a fury to which I now blindly abandoned myself, my uncomplaining wife, alas, was the most unusual and most patient of my sufferers. One day she accompanied me, upon some household errand, into the cell.